before we get there, I'm going to explain why I'm talking about a hacker and what's a hacker, because people have these ideas, oh, hackers are pirates. But in fact, it's a term uh, to use in our days uh, to talk about the clever programmer, a person that is very, very good, you know, with uh, computers, uh, with programs, with internet. But in fact, a hacker is someone that is able to hack or to change something uh, into something different. It, uh, so it has many different meanings besides uh, computing. So depending on the context, some people uh, uh, associate it with uh, subcultures. And, uh, and we, we hear a, a lot about the community now, it's called Anonymous. I don't know if you heard about Anonymous. Anonymous, it's a very powerful community of hackers. So when they don't like something, they attack, and they attack states, they attack uh, Israel, they attack the United States, they attack... They, whenever there's something they think it's unethical, they attack. And when I say they attack, they cause a lot of problems, not only in websites, but they can put down places. You know, uh, the certain dictators, they're in trouble. When, when uh, Anonymous attacks them, they're in trouble. They attack Libya, they, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a subculture group. And who is this group? Well, the name says, says it all, Anonymous. It's people from around the world that are uh, geniuses and they know how to do uh, specific things. So that's, that's how we know a hacker. But today I wanna to talk in a different context. And um, why people hack, it's, uh, it's a subject that uh, sometimes we discuss, but it's, uh, a, a hacker, someone that has this mentality, likes to fix things, find out how things are made, and I guess some kids start very early. Uh, personally, I started very early to, when they give me my, my Christmas toys, I will open them completely. You know, some were before batteries. You know before batteries how it worked? There was a key and we did <laughs> How many of you remember this? Oh, so we have some old folks here. <laughs> So, so I, and I will open because I wanted to see how does this thing work. Then with batteries, I was even more excited because I saw the transistors and those things and I was able to open and close and open and close and then I started to modify these things. So it's something that, you know, uh, really talked to me and I like to find out how things are made. So the non-hack has uh, many different uh, senses, sometimes very ugly connotations. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about hackers in a different sense and a hacker in that subculture uh, world when they achieve something that's really uh, you know important an achievement it's called an exploit and this is how I came to the title of this message because I like to talk about uh, in the Christian context about what uh, a, a, a Christian, let's say, call it a Christian hacker is, all right? And for that, I'll read a scripture, which is found in the book of Daniel on chapter 11. And just before we read this scripture, let me just mention what is it talking about. Daniel was a prophet and he had powerful visions and very accurate visions. So he, he uh, uh, talked a prophecy and he wrote this prophecy. The prophecy was already fulfilled in part in the time of Daniel and, and a few years uh, after his death. But uh, there's parts of that prophecy that people know they're, they're a projection in the future. Now, not talking about biblical prophecy, this scripture comes from that prophecy of Daniel. And in that prophecy, he's talking about difficult times, times of war, times in which Jerusalem will be occupied. And uh, right in the place of the temple of Jerusalem, uh, the, the worship will be re replaced by um, a, a leader. The leader is called the man of sin. And this man of sin is referenced in the New Testament with the name Antichrist. So have you ever heard this name Antichrist? Amen. So the name Antichrist, it's the one that opposes the message of Christ. So it's not a title, but it's a, a function of this specific leader that will come. However, this prophecy gives us a principle because uh, what Daniel is saying, it's in the middle of a, of a turmoil where this Antichrist is seducing people to abandon uh, religion, to abandon Christ and just to follow his concepts. And he just using different methods to do so. 
In the middle of all this, something happens. And we arrive now to Daniel 11.32. That says, And such as violate the covenant, he shall pervert and seduce with flatteries. But the people who know their God shall prove themselves strong and shall stand firm and do exploits for God. Exploits for God. So I would like to explore today this Bible verse that I mentioned is so important to me. Because in the very early uh, stage of my Christian life, when I read this scripture, I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, this is going to be your life. And I tried to grasp what he's talking about. This is why I know this passage so well. And he's talking that this man of sin is seducing people with flatteries. You know that flattery can be a sin. Have you ever been to places, even sometimes churches, where there's a lot of flattery and people exalt themselves and they say, oh, here is, uh, can I use your name? Here's Wendy. She's extraordinary. Oh, and, and her voice, when she sings, oh, the birds, just, they're just quiet because they want to listen to her. And, 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 wow, that was good, eh? <laughs> and, and, but flattery, it's like this, it's, it's to elevate people. I'm not saying you shouldn't elevate people and praise them and, and give them value. But when it's out of what it should, it becomes flattery. And it's a way to please people. And people love flattery. And so it's mentioned here that the way that the Antichrist seduces people, it's by flattery. Saying, oh, you're so good. Why are you wasting your talent, you know, playing in a church? Playing music in a church. Oh, you're so good doing this. Why don't you become a motivational speaker? Oh, no, you're, you're so good organizing things here. You know, why don't you work for the political party, you know, and for the elections? And, uh, and this all starts with flattery. So putting aside the flattery let's go to part uh, second part or part B of this verse and this is where I would like to focus because it says that people that know their God will stand firm will prove themselves uh, strong will stand firm and will do exploits for God so how many of you would like to do exploits for God you know exploits it's things that we do against all odds and to know God it's different to know about God. Because there's a lot of people that know things about God. You see, you can go to the university, to McGill University here in Montreal, and take a, a degree in theology. And in theology, you will know about God, about people that follow God, but you will never learn who God is taking a course of theology. Well, I mentioned McGill. Let me mention any Christian uh, university where people go in order to learn how to serve God and they want to become pastors or evangelists or whatever. They want to serve God. And many times they go to those places to learn, but they won't learn who God is. They will learn about God, what He does and what He did. But there's a difference that is an, an abysmal difference between knowing about God and knowing God. There's a lot of Christians that know many things about God. They know the Bible cover to cover, but they never had an encounter with the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who created you, the one who called you, the one who, has, who wants to have fellowship with you. So people have all these distorted ideas about God because of what they read, because of their own conclusions. And there are so many gods. People say, oh, I believe God, but I believe God my way. That's a good thing. Believe God your way. As long as you know God. Because when you have an encounter with God, then something happens. You know, when you know God, not everything that happens to your life is going to be good and pleasant. That's why it says that the people that know their God, what does it say? They will, they will stand firm. They will prove themselves strong. They will stand firm. And they will do exploits. So let, let, let me just uh, uh, dissect these three things. First, you need to know God. Because doing exploits, it's a consequence of knowing God. 
And let me also tell you, if you're not doing exploits, and I'm going to explain very well what an exploit is, I doubt that you know God. Maybe you know about God, but when you know God, you cannot just live your ordinary life. Because when you know God, your life is no ordinary life. It's extraordinary. It's supernatural. It's beyond what people in the world think it's acceptable. And they will be shocked with the things you do. They'll say, how come you pray all night? Are you nuts? Are you crazy? And you're going to church. Such a beautiful day. What are you going to do to church? You know, to lock yourself there. But when you know God, you want to be where God is. You want to have fellowship with Him and with His people. Know God. The second thing in this verse, it says they will prove themselves strong and they will stand firm. How do you prove yourself strong? You need to show that you're strong. To prove yourself, it's a show of force. You need to show that you're strong and firm. Firm means that you're attacked you're pushed, you're, you know, people try to push you away, but you stand firm. Because you stand on the rock, which is Christ. Amen. And when you stand on the rock, which is Christ, the winds will come, the storm will come, but your house will be firm because it's firmed on the rock. You're firm. When you know about God, you built your house in sand. And when the storm comes, you wash the way, like we, we, we see on television, those floods and the houses being washed away like, like matchboxes. And we look at that and we say, wow, that's the, the strength of nature. But when you have Christ, you're firm, you're firm. And after you pass these tests, then you're ready for level three. Amen. They do exploits. They do exploits. Now, the dictionary defines exploits this way. An act or deed, especially a brilliant or heroic one. To employ to the greatest possibly, po possible advantage. To take advantage of something to the extreme. And third, to advertise or to promote. That's what an exploit is in the dictionary. And that's what an exploit is in the Bible. When you know God, and when you stand firm, you're going to do things that no one expects. Things that people say they are impossible. You're going to take advantage of things to the extreme. And you're going to be able to advertise or promote, to advertise or promote what? Not your life, but the kingdom of God. Amen. So this is what an exploit is. And let me tell you that we are the people of God. We are the ones that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. We are the ones that are supposed to do exploits for our God. Things that are out of the ordinary. Things that are extreme. Things that move and shake circumstances and shake our world. We were called, you know for what? To conquer Montreal and Quebec for Jesus. And when people say that there's less of 1% Christians here, let me tell you, God is counting on us to do a lot more than Christians do in certain areas that are called the Bible belts or the Bible whatever, where you have a church at every corner and you say, oh, these people are so blessed. They're blessed, but they don't have the opportunity. You do. Because whenever the circumstances are opposing God's kingdom, we have a great opportunity in the Lord. Amen. Just last week, we, we listened about uh, uh, last Sunday, uh, uh, two terrorists entered the church in Pakistan and they blew themselves and they killed 80 people, m many of them children, and they injured more than 200 people in a church with 400 people in Pakistan. And people listen about this and they say, wow, that's terrible. I don't want to go to Pakistan. I don't want to go there to Pakistan. Oh, that's the, uh, the terrible place to be. But you know why this is happening? Because the news that are not being told is that hundreds and thousands of Muslims, Muslims in Pakistan, that's Osama bin Laden's hall, they're coming to Christ. Amen. Muslims are converting by the hundreds and by the thousands. That's why the reaction. You know why? Because Christians are doing exploits. Do you think a bomb is going to, to just to, sh to shut them down? 
No way. No way. Because in the middle of persecution, it's where the people that know their God excel. Mm -hmm. Have you read the book of Acts? When they started to be, to be persecuted, it's when they started to do amazing miracles and resurrections. And the church was multiplying. And you have salvations by the thousands. Why? Because they're being persecuted. Because they stand firm. Stephen stands firm, even to death. And after his death, Paul was touched by the Holy Spirit. And he took the torch. And he did so many exploits to the Lord. Amen. We are the people. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and the people of His own, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who in time past, we're not a people, but now we are the people of God. Can you say with me, we are the people. We are, we are the people. Amen. You know, that's not just a song for little children in Africa. We are the people. We are the people. And we are the wild branch that was grafted into the natural branch. And we became the people of God. We, we weren't the people. Now we're grafted in the tree. We are the people. Passion Canada, we are the people. And we're flourishing under God's economy. And we're going to do exploits for the Lord. And it doesn't matter what people say. What matters, it's what God thinks about you. Yes. We're about to do great things. Yeah. We are the people. We are up to the task that God has put before us. It's a big task. But let me tell you, we're going to do it because if God is for us, who can be against us? God is with you. And is God picking us? Yes, He's picking us. Why? Because we decided to leave out of the four walls of the comfort of a traditional church just to invade darkness. You know, when we arrive to this movie theater, it's so dark. And the first thing we need to do is to put on the lights because we want to see in the spirit. Montreal is a dark place Amen. and God is counting on us. God is counting on you. And the Bible is full of people that do exploits. I love reading about those exploits. You just read the chapter, chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. And you have a long list, 16 people, Abel, Enoch, Enoch Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, you have the stories of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of David, of Samuel. And you know, the, some of these stories, David and Goliath, you know, those, those were mighty men and women of God. The Bible is not a book of losers. The Bible is a book of people that are more than conquerors. Amen. And you are called to be more than conqueror in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are called to hack the system. You need to have a hacker mentality, not to hack into computers. But a hacker is constantly looking for things to exploit. Give a hacker a fridge and he will make a, 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 a something to smoke sausages. <laughs> That's it. You know, give a hacker something and it will change into something different. Give him a computer and he will break into all the networks that he can. Not to rob or to steal. That's not the intention of the hacker. He wants to do the exploit. He wants to do the exploit. And when I talk about the hacker mentality reflecting in Christians, is that we need to have this mentality, I'm going to do the exploit. So they say we cannot have uh, churches in Montreal that flourish. Let's show the enemy that he's wrong and let's do an exploit. How do we do an exploit? We do something that no one has ever thought about. That's what the next exploit is. Nobody ever did this, so let's do it. Nobody ever brought a revival to Montreal. Let's do it. We are the people. We were called by God to do exploits. We are not called to comfort people. Some people have this idea of Christianity that they come to church to be comforted. If you're comfortable in church and thank God for those sofas, where you're sitting, we have the best chairs of any church in the neighborhood. <laughs> Thank God for that, but you're not called to be comfortable. You need to be uncomfortable, unease with things. And when you look around and when you see sin in this city, you don't need to hate the city. You love the city. You love the sinners. And you try to figure out a way how we're going to do an exploit and change the circumstances of this city. 
Let me tell you, Jesus said that a good tree cannot bear good, uh, bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree, uh, every tree that does not bear fruit, it's cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. He's talking about false Christians. And he's telling in this context that it's like a tree that bears fruit. Now, yesterday I was apple picking and some of those apples were just horrible. I mean, they're, they're apples to do pies and, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it, those are apples to cook. Then they have the other section with the Macintosh and all those apples that are sweeter. But some of those apples were just terrible. And I was there with, with, with Andrew and we, we took a bite and, oh, this is worse than a lemon. I cannot eat this. This is really horrible. And I don't want apples from this tree. Let's try another tree. And there was a crowd, unbelievable. There's probably more, there was thousands of people, literally, picking apples yesterday. Thousands of people. I'm not exaggerating. And as we walked, I found some trees that, that the, the apples were sweeter. It said, this is a good one. Let's fill our bag here. Let's not fill it there. So this is the way that God sees your life. We all bear fruit. Some it's fruits of bitterness, sour fruits, fruits of criticism and anguish. But God called you to give good fruit, fruit that lasts. And by your fruits, you will be known. What are the fruits? It's not just winning souls, but it's to do exploits you were called to do exploits in John chapter 14 Jesus said I tell you the truth anyone who has faith in me will be will do what I have been doing that's strong eh do you have faith in Jesus Amen. I do <laughs> are you doing the words of Jesus Amen. that's a bold statement and then he says he will even do greater things than this because I'm going to the Father. Not because you're very good, not because he's so smart, but because he's going to the Father and from the throne of God, he will be helping you to do the exploits and the exploits are the things that he did. It's when you go to a place that no one expects a Christian to go. And in that place, you manifest the presence and the power of God. You don't just speak words, you manifest the power of God. God has the power to heal. God has the power to transform, to deliver, to change circumstances, to give life to the death. God has that power. Are you doing those works? And you say, no, 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 I can never do the works of Jesus. Yes, you're right. Who are we to compare with Jesus? We will not do the works of Jesus. But listen, we will not do the works maybe in quality, but maybe we can do it in quantity. Just last month, I, I was with evangelist Reinhard Bonk and his team, and I was watching, you know, the, the, the crowds that they preach in Africa. Never Jesus Christ preached to a crowd of a million people. That I can guarantee. He never preached to a crowd of a million people. And there's a man doing this every month now, you know, for the last almost 20 years. He preaches for crowds of millions of people. Jesus never preached to a crowd of a million people. Is he bigger than Jesus? Of course not. He doesn't want to be bigger than Jesus. But, it, but is the miracle even greater? Yes, it is. Because Jesus never preached to a million people. He did an exploit. Amen. He did an exploit. And preaching the gospel in Muslim nations, where it is forbidden to preach the gospel, that's an exploit. You know what? We're also living in a, an almost communist socialist society. That's our society here. The society opposes anything that is religious. And just the fact that we are here in this theater, it's an exploit. It's the grace of God. God did something. God did something in the natural. Because it was impossible for us to be here. We will never be allowed. And we're the first church to ever be in this chain of movie theaters. Not because we're special. But because in the right time, I could obey the Holy Spirit and I was bold enough to, you know, go through the system and arrive to the right person. And he was so gracious and they were so gracious to, uh, you know, with us. We've been so blessed of being here. And it's a thing that you might not think, well, it's uh, just for chance. It's not chance. It's an exploit. Amen. 
Now, in John 15, 6, 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and what? Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Let me put the, today's translation. And do exploits. And do exploits. And do something different. And fruit that will last. It's not just giving a few shots in the air. It's fruit that lasts. So this is the verse that we've learned today. The people that know their God, they will prove themselves strong and shall stand firm and do exploits for God. So God is not going to show himself strong for you. He's waiting for you to show yourself strong for him. Do you want me to repeat this? Because sometimes evangelists and pastors lie to you. They lie to you in order to please you. With bad intentions? I don't know. Maybe some. But the biggest lie that you can be told is that God will do everything for you. Yes, He'll move mountains for you. But He's waiting on you to do the exploits. Read the Bible from cover to cover. You'll see people that under the most terrible circumstances, they did mighty exploits for the Lord. Oh, I love that list of men that followed David. They were considered outlaws, outcasts. Nobody wanted anything to do with those, those men. And there on the Bible, we have a whole chapter dedicated to them. And they're called the valiant men, the men of valor that followed David. And they were persecuted by the law. They were persecuted by the king. They were persecuted by the government. But they stood firm and in the right time, they were elevated to a great position. But they didn't just lay down expecting for God to battle their own battles. They did it. They did it for, for the Lord. They did it also for themselves. And that's what God is expecting from us. God will not win the battle for us. He's expecting us you know, to put our feet on the water and the waters will part. God is expecting on you. God is counting on us. And let me tell you, we are the people. You are the people. Maybe you're going through terrible circumstances in your life, persecution, loss of a job, infirmities, all these things. Nevertheless, God is counting on you. Because as you stand firm, as you resist that infirmity, as you resist that circumstances of your life, the idea will come to do the exploit. Something will happen. And sometimes it's something small. You think just, oh, I'm just going to feed some children. And suddenly you have an organization like, like World Vision. And you think, oh, I'm just going, you know, to talk the gospel to this person. And that man converts and he becomes the most powerful evangelist of our time. God is counting on us to have this mentality that I call today the hacker mentality. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm not teaching you to be pirates. I'm not teaching you, you know, to do things that are illegal. But I'm teaching you that when we have the presence of God, when we know who we are in Christ, we will do powerful and mighty things for our God. Can you give a hand of applause to the Lord? Yes. Praise God. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name yes. that you'll touch bodies, Lord, not just here in this theater, but I pray, Lord, also over the, the internet. And Lord, yes. I pray for the people that are watching yes. uh, this broadcast that you will touch their bodies right now. And now I plead the blood of Jesus and the powerful yes. glory of God and the miracles of God to touch yes. these bodies in Jesus' name. Yes. Lord, I also pray for people that are struggling with addiction and with terrible circumstances in their lives. Lord, just touch them. Yes. Let your children stand firm. In the evil day let them stand firm let them resist and God I know as they do this they will be willing and ready to do the next step they will do exploits for you let all these people that are present here begin doing exploits all over this city in the workplace in their homes in their family Lord let them do exploits when they go to the supermarket let them do do exploits Lord when they travel let them do exploits for you and let your glory be seen in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Give a hand of applause to the Lord.